Hello and welcome to the webinar on Lowering Financial Risk by Increasing Soil Health by Mark Schoenbeck of the Organic Farming Research Foundation. I'm your host, Alice Formiga of eOrganic. eOrganic has many articles, videos, and webinars about organic farming and research, and you can find all of them on our website and on the eOrganic YouTube channel. This webinar will last about an hour, and when it's over, we'll have 30 minutes for questions. This is the second of two webinars funded by the Risk Management Agency. The first one, from several weeks ago, was about insurance options for organic farmers, and the recording is available on the eOrganic YouTube channel. This webinar will be presented by Mark Schoenbeck, who is a research associate at the Organic Farming Research Foundation. Mark has worked for the last 31 years as a researcher, consultant, and educator about organic and sustainable agriculture. He also works with the Virginia Association for Biological Farming. Okay, so now I'm going to hand over the screen control to you, Mark, and you can just click on the PowerPoint to take control. Okay, great, thank you. <clears throat> okay, uh, well, the last webinar focused on how you could manage your risk as an organic farmer with existing crop insurance products. And this time we are going to look at how you can reduce the need for crop insurance claims through improving your soil. <clears throat> so as you all know, uh, farming is risky, a long list of things that can happen, bad weather, bad crop stands from whatever uh, cause, poor seed, whatever, um, crop nutrient deficiencies, pests, weeds, and diseases, the terrible three, and uh, of course, uh, fickle markets, low prices, that can be just as risky as anything happening on the farm. But one, that, one risk that really stands out in the long run is soil degradation and loss. It's the thief of uh, farm profits because <clears throat> the impacts go for many years. And one thing that's going to happen as the uh, weather extremes get more intense, climate change uh, continues some of these risks, all the ones related to weather, are likely to intensify. Um, see an example of a flood close to home, close to where I live, um, almost in our backyard there, which happened a few years ago, and then uh, Rodale Institute trials during a drought. Um, <clears throat> so another thing that'll, that will shift and generally become more risky are um, pests, de uh, diseases, and weeds, because as climate zones shift, the distribution of these um, unwanted organisms will also shift so that new pests, new weeds, and new diseases are likely to turn up at a given location. And uh, in some cases, for instance, weed growth may intensify as temperatures increase, and certain diseases that are associated with higher temperatures might get worse as well as moving north. <clears throat> So there are um, production risks associated with um, organic farming. Of course, all farms can run into these. Um, but two uh, themes that emerge very often uh, for organic farmers is uh, yield limitations because of insufficient nitrogen when the crops need it, and also because of weed competition. And <clears throat> Uh, another thing that organic farmers face is that organic inputs, the materials that are allowed by the National Growing Organic Program or NOP, uh, USDA certification, uh, do tend to cost more than their conventional counterparts. And on the average, uh, organic yields are a little bit lower. Uh, a lot of this traces to the historical lack of research and plant breeding efforts for organic and sustainable systems. Uh, another thing is that um, organic farming is intensely, inten uh, inherently very knowledge intensive. You've got to know a lot about your entire agro ecosystem uh, when you don't have these handy, strong chemicals to fall back on. <clears throat> but there are many ways that organic farming reduces risks. One is uh, by, by not using the synthetic inputs, you're protecting soil life and many other beneficial organisms above and below ground and uh, protects water quality. Uh, that means your water is gonna be safer for your own family to drink, to use in irrigation, and less worry about uh, state or federal environmental agencies um, putting you at regulatory risk for having uh, bad water quality. Um, one thing that really makes a big difference is you don't have to worry about herbicide carryover if you're not using herbicides, 
that means that if you want to, you got a certain rotation, you want to add a specialty crop like purple okra, or let's go with, you know, heirloom peppers or lima beans, or if you don't have a cucurbits in the rotation, putting them in. If you're not using herbicides, you can easily fit them in anywhere in the rotation, never have to worry about herbicide carryover. And of course, not using synthetic inputs can save money, especially if you're um, not using genetically modified seeds that have a patent and a, and a stiff technology fee associated with them. Another way in which organic farming reduces risk more directly is that most organic inputs uh, build up soil health. And the uh, site yield decrease with uh, organic systems is often compensated uh, by organic price premiums and the strong market demand. Uh, the consumers demand food that is grown in an earth-friendly manner or is free of uh, pesticide residues. So that gives you uh, that advantage. <clears throat> The transition period is an especially risky time for two key reasons. One is very often when you're taking a field from conventional to organic production systems, you're starting with some real significant soil health problems. Uh, this soil looks kind of depleted and sandy and a little dead, and it is growing a decent crop of, um, looks like onions or garlic just coming up there. Um, however, you can run into compaction or history of erosion, which has robbed some of the topsoil. Organic matter and soil life tend to be below par. And as a result, nutrients are released more slowly. So that nitrogen shortfall is more uh, severe um, in many cases. And there can be a higher risk of diseases because there's kind of a biological vacuum. The beneficial soil life is not quite up to snuff. And during the transition, you have a greater decrease in yield. And that's compounded by the fact that you will not receive the price premiums for those first three years until you're able to certify the land as organic, uh, 36 months away from all prohibited inputs. And if you are a new farmer or a transitioning conventional farmer, you are facing a, a steep learning curve. So all of those things um, are in the risk side of the balance here. <clears throat> So uh, there's some really good resources for managing risk during transition. Uh, I recommend this bulletin by um, in the ATRA News uh, and the entire National Sustainable Agriculture Information Service or ATRA at this website uh, provides a lot of valuable information. It's really important to start right off negotiating that learning curve. Uh, if you can line up a good mentor or a consultant to work with you, that's a big plus. Um, Attend conferences and field days, excellent sources of information. Uh, almost all the state and regional organic sust and sustainable agriculture conferences, like if you're in the Midwest, the uh, Midwest Sustainable um, uh, Moses, the Midwest Organic and Sustainable Education Service has a huge conference in Southern region, Southern SOG, uh, Western region, there's uh, the Eco Farm Conference. Um, the Northeast, uh, Northeast Organic Farming Association also provides uh, excellent um, gatherings. Uh, online information resources are continually growing. Um, some of these are elaborated in your, in your handout. A couple of examples are eOrganic itself, uh, which is bringing you this webinar, and Organic Farming Research Foundation, and most of the state and regional organic uh, farming organizations also um, offer excellent resources. Another pointer is if it, it works in your system, it's better to transition part of the farm at a time rather than trying to take the entire farm through that risky transition period at once. This way, um, if you have part of your farm still being managed the way it had in the past, uh, using, using uh, approaches, uh, practices that you're familiar with, and perhaps if you've been in transition for a while, you will have some farms that are, uh, some fields that are certified organic, have restored their soil health somewhat and are giving you the premium price supporting income. And you may have a few fields in transition. Um, and during that transition period, you wanna focus on building soil and managing weeds. Those are gonna be your two top priorities. So focus on cover crops, consider putting it into a perennial sod phase. If you have other uh, land in production or other enterprises that can tide you over financially, or if you need to produce something, uh, look for low maintenance crops. Here in the South, I give the example might be sweet potatoes. Uh, they don't need a lot of uh, babying in order to give you a, a respectable yield. 
Okay, so let's look at a few ways that healthy soil reduces risk. Um, the physical properties of a good soil is crumbly in it and it's easy to work. So that means it's easier to get in there and plant on time. Uh, you're using less fuel. You don't have to till it as hard. Uh, you don't need as much uh, horsepower to carry out a field operation. Uh, that loose open structure, it's much easier for crops to emerge from a, a soil that's like that. Uh, and also it's easier to take out weeds when it's crumbly like that. Very light cultivation uh, is, is easy to accomplish. And a soil that has a very uh, robust crumb structure or aggregation will reduce both compaction and erosion uh, so that in a given force of rain or wind, you will lose much less soil that looks like this than the fine sandy uh, soil with low organic matter you saw on a previous slide. And eventually you have this uh, sustained fertility, which uh, of course reduces risk and costs. Um, another thing about the soil physical properties um, and the high organic matter, it increases the, both the water storage capacity and the ability to drain out and, and become aerated again after a heavy rain so that the water infiltrates in deeply and with good soil structure throughout, the roots can go deep, can access that entire um, extent of uh, uh, water reserves. And uh, soil that's in good physical condition also holds more um, higher number of grams of water per gram of soil. So there's, even though it's better aerated, uh, it has also got more moisture for the crop. So you have increased drought resilience. You will, you'll be spending less on irrigation. And since you're not irrigating as much, um, you will also have reduced runoff and erosion from the irrigation itself. And also that good structure, of course, um, absorbs the moisture so it doesn't run off uh, and create gullies. And another thing about this good drainage aspect is you're gonna have healthier plant roots and much less disease. And uh, as well, they, it, uh, there's fewer uh, planting delays rated to weather. Here's a perfect example of what can happen. The field on the left is one of the organic uh, plots in the long-term Rodale uh, farming systems trial. This is about 15 years in to the process and they had a really bad drought year. And uh, look at the corn on the left, the crop is healthy, it's growing vigorously. Whereas on the right, uh, this corn is uh, quite thirsty. And the reason is the organically managed soil was able to absorb the rains that occurred earlier in the season more effectively. So it had a greater moisture reserve to tie that crop over. And in the end of the season, uh, the uh, organic um, corn out yielded the conventional by 31%. <clears throat> so another thing that happens in um, healthy soil is um, improved nutrient cycling so that the soil life is actively engaged in ensuring that nutrients that are delivered through residues and manure, et cetera, and that are stored in the active organic matter are delivered to the crop in a timely fashion. And another thing that happens is as the soil life works on these residues, it also makes stable organic matter, which expands the cation exchange capacity of the soil and therefore increases its capacity to hold the ammonium nitrogen calcium, potassium, magnesium, and a number of micronutrients with positive charge. And unfortunately, it's going a little off the screen, at least on my computer. Uh, but down here, this depicts soil minerals. Uh, that's the ultimate source of uh, most nutrients, not nitrogen, which is from the air, but most of the other nutrients. And the soil life and this plant roots, which are really part of the soil life as well, they gradually weather those minerals and bring nutrients into circulation, either on the cation exchange capacity or for the anions that bring it right into the plant tissue and into the active organic matter. And, and an optimally healthy soil will deliver enough nutrients to crops that won't be uh, flooding the soil solution with excesses that could leach away. Uh, in any case, one of the biggest risk reducing factors in uh, uh, favorable soil fertility and nutrient cycling is lower fertilizer cost. You just won't need to add as much if the soil life and the soil uh, organic matter and minerals are providing it. This is a, uh, from a, a webinar and also from a, a presentation by uh, Dr. Robin Clute. Uh, he's in South Carolina. 
Uh, this is based on a five-year trial on a loamy sand soil in South Carolina, a coastal plain and managed organically with a corn soy wheat rotation but with cover crops and organic practices and he decided to compare what happens if you don't put any of the phosphorus or potassium on that's recommended by the soil test and if you cut the recommended nitrogen rates in half well, over a five-year period not only did the crops give full yield without the added phosphorus and potassium uh, but the soil pH and nutrient levels were basically pretty stable, and the soil organic matter actually accrued significantly. 1.7% is a very good level for a loamy sand. And you can see what in this uh, soil profile, two things you notice, although it's a very sandy coastal plain soil, the upper foot or so is nice and dark. There's quite a buildup of organic matter. And even in that subsoil horizon, it's open enough that the plant roots are getting down in there and tapping moisture and nutrient reserves. That's important during a period of drought. If it doesn't rain for a month, there's not much going on in that top foot, no matter how good the organic matter, all the soil life is gonna to go to sleep and wait for the rain. But if the plants can get down deep, uh, they will continue to thrive and, or at least um, stay in uh, reasonably good condition through the dry spell. Here's another example. Uh, oh, I wanted to, one thing I wanted to mention is that uh, Dr. Clute also cited several farmers from a diversity of locations, Northern Great Plains, semi-arid, Northeast, North Central, uh, cool, wet climates, all of them have drastically cut their fertilizer bills and fertilizer inputs through integrated organic systems, uh, just finding they needed far less NPK than recommended. Uh, another uh, interesting study out in uh, uh, UC Santa Cruz in the Central California, uh, they looked at 13 different uh, fields that were under organic management for tomato production. And they found three patterns. One is nitrogen deficient, where the tomato was um, restricted by low soil organic, uh, low soil nitrogen levels, and also relatively low organic matter. These fields had not been in organic production all that long. We're probably in that transition period uh, in terms of soil health. And then there was a situation where it was nitrogen saturated, and that's where the organic farmer said, okay, I'm going to make sure there's plenty of nitrogen in this soil to grow a really good tomato crop and they put concentrated organic sources like bat guano, uh, a poultry litter, even a little bit of uh, um, Chilean nitrate perhaps. And these are more mature fields that had more organic matter, but they had high levels of soluble nitrogen which supported the yields and risked the loss of leaching, uh, nitrogen through leaching. And they found four fields that had something they called tightly coupled nitrogen cycling. And the organic matter was high, the biological activity was high. Similar, these two had similarly high biological activity, but what was going on here was that the bulk soil nitrogen levels were relatively low. The soil was amended primarily with a mixed um, a compost from mixed organic materials, and the compost had a moderate carbon to nitrogen ratio, about 20, which means that it was not releasing a lot of nitrogen at once. And the crops were just, supplemented with a small amount of in-row uh, concentrated nitrogen, either poultry litter or uh, liquid fish fertilizer or a little bit of Chilean nitrate um, to give them a little boost. But overall, um, when the crop got large, uh, the soil life and some crop enzymes were helping the crop to work with the soil to release nitrogen just right in the root zone as it was needed rather than flooding the entire soil with nitrogen. <clears throat> so uh, other ways that soil, um, a vigorous soil biota will reduce uh, risk is they reduce the risk of plant disease uh, and they just generally increase the crop resilience and they enhance nutrient water use efficiency. And I'll show you a little bit more about how this happens. Um, mycorrhizal fungi are one of the most important groups of soil organisms for uh, production and for risk reduction because they aid in the uptake not only of phosphorus, but of most nutrients and of moisture. This is how the mycorrhizal fungi work. This is a, a root um, and the fungi grow out into the soil, send their hyphae out into the soil and then have this little thing called an arbuscule, which is sort of like a, um, a trading post where the plant is feeding the fungus 
anywhere from 10 to 20 percent perhaps of its photosynthetic product but in turn the mycorrhizal fungi are doubling tripling quadrupling the effective volume and capacity of the root system improving moisture uptake and uh, uh, retrieving phosphorus from insoluble sources micronutrients etc and the red dots are other beneficial organisms, mostly bacteria that tend to accrue and uh, accumulate in the, uh, uh, excuse me, congregate right in the rhizosphere or in the root zone, on the root, near the root, even inside the root tissues. And they do various things uh, from fixing a little bit of nitrogen. A lot of non-legumes can host nitrogen fixing bacteria in this matter, not as tight of association as the nodules on legumes, uh, but they make a contribution. A lot of them are a lot of these bacteria are cycling nitrogen, helping the plant to turn organic nitrogen into absorbable um, plant available nitrogen. Other nutrients, some of these organisms release uh, beneficial growth factors like a little bit of auxin or something else, other plant hormones that, that stimulate and regulate plant growth. Others repel disease. Uh, in any soil biota, you have a few characters with, with a bad attitude that like to eat the plant and bring your crop down. But when you have a strong rhizosphere uh, microbiota and a strong soil life overall, it acts as a shield. Basically, these guys don't have a chance to chomp your crop very hard. You might have a little bit, but you're not gonna have disease. Um, another really cool thing that's been demonstrated is that some of these organisms not only protect the root from root rot, but they stimulate an immune response so that up here, if some airborne foliar blight arrives, the plant is less likely to come down with it because these beneficial guys are turning on the plant's uh, immune system in effect. So let's look at some of the challenges. Um, how do you get to soil health? You start with one of those soils that's kind of tired. You, you gotta apply basically four important principles of soil management plus adhering to the organic regulations of not using any of the um, uh, uh, prohibited inputs. So you wanna keep your soil covered as much as possible. You wanna diversify the cropping system. Here's a four-way uh, mix of cover crops, oats, barley, mustard, and peas. Uh, this is a cash crop system where there's so many different plants growing there that I couldn't tell you what all it was. It looks like some herbs, some flowers, and uh, some vegetables on a trellis. Um, maintain living roots. Uh, when you've got a good cover crop, uh, for instance, this is the roots of uh, a, a annual ryegrass. Um, that's building soil every day. It's exuding goodies into the soil life and it's improving the crumb structure. So that's the kind of thing you want going on. And minimize disturbance. If you can roll down your cover crop and plant no-till, great. We'll get to that a little bit later. But these things are challenging. They all require skill and um, so I see this as a journey. You wanna get from here, dead soil, uh, it's really dormant. There's actually a lot of soil life in there. It's just dormant, it's not functioning. And you treat it well, you keep it covered, you uh, minimize tillage, and you get this after a number of years. So this is what you want. But in the meantime, you're gonna encounter a couple of hurdles. You got some direct costs. You plant cover crops, you gotta buy the seed, you gotta uh, get out there with a the tractor or whatever and sow it. You gotta manage it with a, either a mower, roller crimper, or tillage implement. There's the learning curve. You're learning new methods of farming. Uh, if you've been doing corn soy and with winter fallow, you have a very simple method, and then you wanna go into um, an integrated organic system. There's a lot to learn. Um, and sometimes there's uh, some foregone income. If you have a soil that's really tired, you gotta put it in a cover crop or a sod crop for a year or two, you won't actually be selling any off, anything off of that land unless you're integrating livestock and grazing them on the sod or the cover crop. Uh, that's an interesting thing to look at. It's actually a fifth principle of soil health is integrating animals into the system. But that is a big learning curve. Um, speaking for myself, I've never milked a cow and I've never uh, strung a, a fence for rotational grazing. So I wouldn't know where to start on that one. And then you do have yield trade-offs, which we'll get into a little bit later. Uh, that can sometimes happen, isn't always the case. National Organic Standards, just wanna point out, they actually require the organic farmer to make this investment in soil health. It isn't just a matter of, okay, I'm swearing off all synthetics, now, I can, now I'm organic, hooray. Well, really, if you read it, and if you're 
certifiers really implementing all of those standards. The tillage and cultivation practices have to be soil friendly, minimize erosion, improve the condition of the soil, or at least maintain it. Um, using rotations, cover crops, and uh, organic amendments to manage nutrients. And then the crop rotation standard is, uh, these are all uh, synopses of the statements in the, in the um, uh, rules. But they emphasize using these sod and cover crops to maintain organic matter and to provide other uh, agricultural ecosystem services. So cover crops, everybody knows all the wonderful benefits of cover crops. And uh, rightly so, they are kind of the, one of the most frequently mentioned and recommended uh, practices. Um, this is a late summer mix, actually in my own garden. Turns out that the radish, the sorghum sudan and the pearl millet all can send roots down five feet deep and breaking up hard pan and scavenging all the extra nitrogen that may be down there. Tremendous range of benefits. A lot of them will reduce your risk. You're spending less on uh, fertilizer, spending less on weed control and uh, less risks of pests and diseases. But you have the direct cost of the seed and the planting. I mentioned that and you can have, you know, there's some risks. You can have delays in plant, cash crop planting, um, depending upon the cover crop and the timing of that is terminated and how it's terminated, it could tie up nitrogen or it could release nitrogen so fast that it leaches away before you can use it. One thing that's important to remember is the water use in dry years. Uh, this can be a real concern, especially in semi-arid regions. Um, on the other hand, if you're in a wet climate or you're having a wet spring, is a tremendous benefit to have that big rye cover crop out there sucking extra moisture out of the ground. You can have cover crop failures. I've had them myself in the garden, or you can have self-seeding. Uh, you see right here, uh, here's a squash crop that's struggling because the uh, crimson clover and barley were rolled down too late and they had formed seeds. So, um, Here's a diversified crop rotation. Uh, this is very important for reducing risk in a number of ways. If one of these crops fails, you're not out of business because maybe you had a bumper crop of broccoli, a good crop of lima beans, and your cereal grain did really well. So you lose one of those six, it's not losing one out of two or losing corn in a, in a corn only system. Um, there's been found that even at the same level of intensity in terms of biomass and cover, if you Reversify your rotation, it builds organic matter and soil biodiversity a little bit. Um, breaking up disease, pest, and weed life cycles with this. Um, and then you have new market opportunities. Say you had only been growing rye, broccoli, and lettuce, and then you go adding lima beans and winter squash and red peppers, and you will draw more customers to your farmer's market or have more opportunities to market at restaurants or whatever your outlet is. Uh, risks and costs, yeah, you gotta, you gotta have new skills and equipment to uh, grow a new enterprise, a new cash crop. Your system is more complex and this is a big, uh, again, it's an issue of learning and skill acquisition. And there can be marketing challenges. If you say, oh great, this, this new crop's gonna fit great in my rotation, but then you have to be sure you have a market for it. Uh, sod phase in the crop rotations, this is another um, way to build uh, the diversity of your system builds soil organic matter. Uh, having that sod phase is, um, many studies have shown the multiple benefits, reduces weed pressure, prevents erosion, rebuilds fertility and tilth, feeds the soil life, um, and it provides forage if you've got animals. Uh, there are a couple of risks and costs. Of course, the income foregone, especially if you don't have any, any uh, animals to graze on it. Um, you do have to till generally to terminate the sod unless you're on a really small scale and you can use tarps, uh, uh, occultation to cut the light. And then it does consume moisture. Uh, most areas, this isn't a big problem if you have a, a climate where it rains at least a couple inches every month. But if you're in a semi-arid region, um, the drawdown of moisture by a, a very high water demand sod such as alfalfa can actually set the crops back for a year or two. Another thing that can happen if you were trying, irrigator to try rotational no-till and roll down your cover crop, if the first cover crop planted after a sod is turned is likely not to be a good candidate for a, a no-till because the sod, the bits of sod will still regrow through that. Okay, no-till planting in a rolled cover crop. Um, 
in numerous studies, the best systems in terms of soil health, soil organic matter, soil biology, uh, soil structure, et cetera, and uh, res resistance to, I mean, eliminating erosion and compaction issues is to grow a high biomass cover crop, roll it down, plant a no-till. This is called, a, um, and you can't do continuous no-till and organic without herbicides, but you can do rotational, which means you roll down the cover crop, plant your cash crop in the residue, and then you till a little bit, just as much as you need to get the next cover crop planted. However, this is probably also one of the riskiest paths to soil health for organic systems. A lot of things can happen. First, you gotta, you gotta get new equipment, and that can really run into some capital investment. Often you run to planting delays or challenges of seed soil contact. Um, the roll cover crop will cool the soil with slow nitrogen release. And because you are not tilling, you will have increased pressure from certain weeds, especially perennials. And um, all of these challenges, the, the planting delay challenges and the cool soil related challenges are increased the further north you get. So in the northern half of this country, very often organic rotational nose till entails a significant yield trade-off as severe as 60% in corn and cereal grains and maybe 20 or 30% in soybean, for example. However, you can have organic no-till successes. Uh, this is one in Virginia Tech. Now this is the exact same experiment where I just showed you that squash that was being choked out by self-seeding cover crop. Well, here we had rye and vetch. And when that one was rolled, it was perfect timing. It, the roller crimper killed the rye and vetch because it was in late flowering to early seed set, but there weren't any mature seeds. So other than a couple of strands of quack grass, there's almost no weed competition, had high yields um, on this crop, good quality. So the factors in success are the high biomass cover crop, the timely termination, uh, and good weed suppression as a result of those first two. Um, balance carbon and nitrogen so that the nutrients are released. Now what that might, you know, balance C to N and um, ideal nutrient release will probably look different in Minnesota, where you probably want all vetch because the soil is rather cool, than it would be in Georgia, where you definitely want the rye with the vetch so that you don't have all the nitrogen come out and disappear before your crop is established. Um, and because this is a warmer climate, the cooling effect was optimal. It kept the soil from getting too hot. <clears throat> so before you begin to wonder, is this really worth the bother? God, it's so complicated to make sure that my benefits exceed my costs and I've got to learn how to deal with the, all these new crops, how to keep the soil covered. Bare soil is a huge risk. Even if you don't have erosion, if you've got a little bit of dead residue on the surface, when you don't have living plants pumping their root exudates into the soil and supporting soil life, you've got a famine down there. And the other thing is, um, even when you got some residue, if you have a bad rainstorm, you're going to have either erosion or compaction or maybe both. Mycorrhizal fungi in particular and some other crop symbionts, they really need a green bridge in order not to go dor dormant and have a severe decrease in their populations. Another thing that happens when the soil life is um, taking cover during a famine like this, um, soluble nutrients will leach. They won't be recycled by the soil life or by the living roots. And then it will increase your fertilizer costs and your water, um, your irrigation costs. So here's another aspect of this whole picture. I call it the soil test paradox. I advise every, I will still advise every organic farmer to get a soil test. You need the information. You need to know your starting point. But um, take the recommendations with a big grain of salt. Because for instance here, this is a soil test from Virginia Tech for tomato and recommendations for tomato. Phosphorus was high. When it's rated high, it means it's optimal. It means the crop's not likely to respond to added phosphorus. Very high, this is, means it's ample or excessive. I would say ample, that's not extreme, but it's, you got plenty of potassium, boron's a little low, pH is perfect. So look at the recommendations. Now that's just a standard, whenever you grow tomatoes, they assume it's gonna need 90 pounds per acre. They don't take into account whether or not the soil life is gonna be able to mineralize a lot of nitrogen. Phosphorus, 100, 100 pounds per acre of phosphate or 44 pounds of elemental phosphorus. Why? Potassium, they even recommending a little bit of potassium. And why do soil labs do this is because 
they assume that the soil is leaky and is going to lose uh, nutrients. And they overlook the possibility of recovery from deep in the soil profile. You're also only measuring the top six inches. Um, and historically, uh, soil test recommendations have ignored the role of soil life. Now, to be fair, I would say that extension services are catching up on this. In fact, I was quite impressed with some revised recommendations out of the Pacific Northwest Extension, Oregon State University, Washington, and Idaho. When they hit high, most of their vegetable crop recommendations are don't add P and K. If it's already high, you don't need it. And they've moderated their nitrogen recommendations by saying, be sure to account for the nitrogen from manure, from cover crops, even from nitrate dissolved in your, in your irrigation water. So uh, the uh, extension services are catching up on this. You gotta watch out for some of the private labs that just come up with all these things you need to add to make your soil better. And uh, you can really run through a lot of money that way. Compost and manure uh, benefits of building organic matter, slow release nutrients, and they do provide it a microbial inoculum, but they are not free of costs and risks. Of course, purchase and hauling. Um, and when you use these materials to provide your nitrogen, you often build up excess phosphorus. And what excess phosphorus does is it deters the activity of these highly beneficial and vital mycorrhizal fungi. And it can hurt water quality if you're really piling it on. If you get your organic matter level so high, especially your active organic matter levels that are mineralizing nutrients, you can actually have as much or more nitrogen in that soil profile as in a heavily fertilized conventional system. And nitrate from any source is nitrate, and it will leach and it will denitrify and make uh, greenhouse gas nitrous oxide. Another fascinating feature, uh, a phenomenon that Cornell University documented is what happens to crop growth and weed growth as you increase the rate of a composted poultry litter. And this is the recommended rate, uh, I think based on maybe the research for organic. So the crops responded up to the recommended rate and then they leveled off. The weeds, this is several different species of weeds that are considered nitrogen responders, lamb's quarters, pigweed, uh, foxtails, velvet leaf, uh, I believe crabgrass was in there as well. As your compost rate goes up and up, they continue to grow. So you've given the weeds a big jump over the uh, crop by putting on more compost and spending more. So let's look at some strategies that the organic farmers often use. One is what I call feed the soil. And this is um, often brand new organic farmers who have read inspiring organic manuals about how you just feed the soil and then the soil life will take care of everything. And that can lead to under fertilization, especially if you are um, just starting out with land that isn't, you know, that's that soil health is not very good. And you say, well, let's just, you know, put on some straw and some wood chips and you know, a little bit of garbage from the kitchen. And okay, we got a few chickens out, there's a little bit of manure, um, but you're not really tracking the nutrients, not really managing them. Uh, very often this leads to the nitrogen limitation. The second one I call is input substitution. That's looking at the soil test report, like that one from Virginia Tech and saying, okay, how do we get 90 pounds of nitrogen, 20 pounds of phosphorus and 60 pounds of potassium from organic sources? and you mix and match and you put it on. And what'll happen there is uh, sometimes you can have high input costs. Sometimes you'll put on more than you need. Sometimes you put on less than you need. And part of this is because the whole dynamics of, a, of an organic system, biologically, uh, biologically mediated nutrient cycling is different from conventionally managed fields for which these uh, um, recommendations are developed. In addition, Nitrogen in an organic source and phosphorus and other nutrients behave differently than when it's put on as 10, 10, 10 or ammonium nitrate, et cetera. The third approach is to say, okay, we need this much nitrogen. We know we have this much nitrogen in the manure and we'll put that much manure on. And oh, they say only 50% of it's available or in compost only 25% is available. So let's multiply by two or multiply by four. Bang, you're gonna have P excesses very quickly. Now, if you've got soil that's really desperately low in phosphorus and it binds a lot of phosphorus, this could be a good strategy for a few years, but you gotta watch the phosphorus trends. And the next one is to replenish nutrients, harvest it off. Get your soil into optimum condition, and then you say, okay, let's just replenish what we take off so we're not mining the soil. Now, the interesting thing is here's some estimates of typical removals of nutrients in harvest. 
vegetables, um, cereal grains, corn, soy, wheat, um, and then hay or uh, uh, silage corn. Now that one actually is removing a lot. You're removing the whole top of the plant at maturity. Here in vegetables, you're removing a young plant. And then you come along and you take typical organic amendments, compost, which is typically one, one, one from a fairly you know, high fertility compost. Put that on a five tons per acre, which isn't very much. You, you barely see it on the soil when you put that much on. Or poultry litter fertilizer at one ton per acre. Now you've done most of the nitrogen you need, more than enough for vegetables. Not quite enough here, but if you've got legumes fixing some, that's okay. Potassium, you're not quite replenishing if you're doing hay, otherwise you're keeping up pretty well. But look at the phosphorus, you put on way more than you need and you're gonna run into um, limitations of the mycorrhizal activity and possible water quality issues. So then you're faced with this thing I call the organic input smorgasbord. It, open any catalog of organic inputs. And in addition to the basic NOP allowed soil mat nutrient management materials like limestone, false sulfur for pH adjustments, rock powders, micronutrients, phosphate rock, worm castings, things like that. Then you have this long list of things that are claimed to make your soil healthier. Humic acids, humates, biochar, various microbial preparations, bokashi, effective microorganisms, compost tea. Benefits, these, the research shows that all of these materials can have benefits. They're certainly going in the right direction. They could enhance soil health and soil life, but the results have not been very consistent in research. So your risks and costs here are mainly the materials and labor to put it on and not getting a result very unlikely to harm your soil with any of these materials, but uh, just keep the costs in mind. Okay, so let's go some practical steps here. They better pick up the pace here, I'm running out of time. Um, first step, you wanna assess the farm's uh, soil resources. Uh, soil test is a good tool, but you have to use it. Read that test through the lens of a living soil. And remember that in healthy soils, crops will often see more than the lab will see. And you look at soil health indicators, either field observations of soil physical conditions, soil life, crop response, um, or you can get some soil health indicator tests. They're kind of specialized right now. A few labs do offer them, um, things like soil microbial respiration and active organic matter. Another the thing that I have to use more and more is the soil survey. Here's an example. NRCS, if you look up your location, they will give you a map. And let's say it's a farm that had, oh, had one field that's kind of stony, and it's been a little hard to till, but it produces pretty well. And they have another field that really produces well. And they have one that's closer to the river and the spots that are really wet. And they think, well, and they also want to expand. You know, I mean, I want to expand into some of the best land. Well, if you have a map, then you can see, oh, okay, well, this one, 8D, that's just too steep to, and erodible to, to, uh, to farm. So let's just let the forest be. 42C, that's a stony soil. So that's why that's, that's, that's natural. That's not because of something to do with management. Over here, we see this is a prime farmland and down here, 13B, we see that's prime farmland. It may need, need a little bit of drainage work. Uh, but then we see this really wet corner. Uh, that's something called hat borrow. It's just too wet to farm. So let's take some of this out of production expand this field, maybe take the stony part of this out of production. Those are the kind of decisions that knowing what your inherent soil properties can help you do. Step two is review your practices and simply lay out your crop rotation, note your fall fallow periods. Uh, are you cover cropping? Uh, what are your tillage practices? How do you manage weeds? And what are your fertilizer inputs? So you wanna say, okay, what are the soil health impacts of these different practices? What are the benefits, costs, possible risks? And can I think of any quick low cost solutions? I mean, an example might be, let's say you're growing winter cereal grains and you're harvesting them at, at full maturity. This is about ready to be harvested. This is rye. And you think, oh, well, instead of tilling the land or leaving it bare, what if I have a nice carpet of red clover there growing until I'm ready to plant potatoes the next year? It's pretty simple to go out with, you know, 10 pounds per acre red clover and overseed it at, you know, in early spring, you frost seed it. So that's an example of a simple solution. Um, so you wanna build a resilient system for your uh, production system for your site. Um, and one thing that's important to do is to take this 
gradually. You don't want to like say, okay, I've got a corn soy rotation. Now I'm going to overnight just turn this into a totally integrated, highly diversified system. You try to take on too much at once. That's one way it is that can actually put a farm under. So you want to add one new practice or crop or enterprise at a time. It's good to start with a small scale trial, maybe do a comparison trial. Uh, say you want to grow a cover crop and, and uh, see how well it does and see how well it, it how compatible it is with your next crop. You might want to try it in a small area first and have some of your cash crop planted without it next door. Do an enterprise budget for a new, um, uh, a new production crop. You want to see, is it likely to make you, uh, make you some more profit? Or a partial budget for a new practice or cover crop, uh, just to get a sense of how much it's costing and then consider that in relation to potential um, profits. So now I'm going to just look at three general areas of, of elements or steps you can take towards cell, soil health. Adding crops as diversity and cover and living root, reducing tillage, disturbance, and then adjusting inputs. Another thing, defray costs. Uh, avail yourself of the Natural Resources Conservation Service programs, the Environmental Quality Incentives Program and Conservation Stewardship Program. Uh, this will help tide you over that initial period. The, uh, it'll help with the initial investment, the costs of the uh, soil health practices. And then avail yourself of the, all of these different information sources, the Organic Farming Research Foundation Soil Health Guides. Uh, there are now nine, including one based on this webinar. Um, eOrganic is an excellent resource. I go there myself all the time to uh, develop the guides and to just help other farmers. Uh, this is Building Soil for Better Crops. This is a SARI manual uh, on uh, healthy soil management. The others on cover crops and rotations are also excellent. Uh, I mentioned ATRA, um, again, another superb resource. And Exploring the Science of Soil Health. This is a web page that NRCS posts. They have a lot of really fascinating farm stories, videos, webinars, et cetera. Okay, adding crops. Cover crops. Just a few tips, you wanna choose the best crops for your need and your regions. Uh, use fresh, good seed, uh, nothing like bad seed coming up and then you have bare soil all winter. That's pretty depressing and it could be very risky. Uh, you wanna optimize your planting date, rate and method. Um, and generally it's good to mix grasses and legumes. You get this balance of carbon and nitrogen uh, and you get more benefits. And sometimes if you're in a short growing season area, it's good to interplant the cover into the cash crop and that gets the cover crop enough time to get established, reduces bare soil. If you're in dry regions, you wanna look for water efficient cover crops such as the millets, barley, um, uh, some of the uh, peas are actually quite uh, water efficient whereas alfalfa is very thirsty as is radish. You may not want those in a dry, uh, dry land rotation. Um, Okay, I think I made a little mistake in what I hit here. Uh, let's try it again. Okay, great. Um, although cover crops are entail a learning curve and there are risks, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, the SARI cover crop surveys show consistent benefits, small yield increases in most years, significant yield increases when there's a drought, and also higher yield increase when the cover cropping has been done for four or five successive years and you've built up soil health. But the farmers are using more and more cover crops because they see the healthier soil. This is the number one thing they see. The other thing is an easier weed management. Uh, this is actually all farmers, not just organic, but um, there's um, all farmers are seeing these benefits in yield stability. And about a third of them actually see a net um, increased return. Here's some resources for cover cropping. Because uh, of our time limitation, I'm gonna kind of skim over some of these. Um, the cover crop councils uh, in each region, there's one just getting started in the West, uh, Northeast and South are in development. Midwest has a very well-established cover crop council, an excellent resource. Um, just check this out um, on the um, archive webinar and the uh, information sheet going with it for more information. Um, adding production crops, um, as I mentioned, it helps avoid a catastrophic loss if one crop fails. And you're further facilitating disease and weed and pest management by diversifying your production. Uh, can provide the grazing and 
a uh, couple things you need to do is uh, market research, do an enterprise budget, and avail yourself of local and regional information on the organic production of the crop you're interested in. Here's some uh, resources for crop diversification. This is an excellent manual. I mentioned that before. It's based on rotations on 12 organic farms uh, developed by Sari and uh, Cornell. Uh, there's this cropping systems calculator. This is developed for the upper Midwest, but I thought that was quite fascinating. It actually looks at the economics of different rotations. And the Southeast uh, Carolina Farm Stewards has uh, some enterprise budgets for different specific crops. So I'll just quickly go over the process for adding new crops. Map out your current rotation, evaluate it, um, and then identify new, one or more new crops that you'd like to add or maybe a substitution that you'd like to consider to diversify. And then you wanna keep a record of your implementation and your outcomes and eventually create a, ba a balance sheet of what are your costs and benefits. Let's do a quick example here. Starting with the corn soy rotation with winter fallow. Um, after the corn, you may have enough residue to protect the soil, but you're probably leaching all that extra nitrogen that the corn may have received. And then after the soybeans, these very little residue and you can run into this situation. So you'll go, okay, we have real concerns here. So what are some remedies? Well, let's follow the corn with a heavy uh, nitrogen scavenging cover crop and follow the soybean where the cover crop is going to cover the ground and provide some nitrogen for the corn and, the, and when you go back to corn. So you go ahead and take it out, uh, you, you carry it out and you look at the outcomes. You say, oh good, corn responded to the veg. Look, those yields are up five, 25%. The rye itself gave you a really good biomass uh, soybean. We had fewer weeds, but, um, and that was one of the concerns in the rotation originally that the soybeans themselves got really weedy. Well, it reduced the weeds, but there are gaps in the stand. And that might tell you, you just have to adjust your planter or maybe get a new planter or a new coulter or something so that it can plant through that really thick residue, uh, assuming that we've rolled the, the soybeans. And then the vetch may have reduced the erosion a little bit, but it didn't leave enough residue to really stop it. So you might think of mixing it with a cereal grain to get more cover. So you wanna look at your costs and your benefits. Of course, the benefits are this yield and stability. You're reducing the need for cultivation. You're reducing your fertilizer bills by growing some of the nitrogen. The costs, as I mentioned, the cover crops, the planting equipment, maybe the new coulters for the soybean planter. Um, and then your long-term benefits, uh, of course, you reduce the erosion, you improve your water quality and you're building soil health. So you might look at this and say, what is a net benefit? It was the income plus the savings and then subtract the costs. And you might say, well, it is costing me a little bit more, but if you look at this long-term and if your farm finances can bear a slightly, a uh, slight decrease in your net here uh, or a slight increased cost, then it may be worth sticking with it. Uh, but then you may even find eventually or even right away that the uh, net return is positive even without considering the long term. But these are the kinds of things you want to uh, think about as you're building this. Reducing tillage. One uh, thing I want to emphasize, you don't have to eliminate all tillage to build soil health during an annual crop rotation. Um, I do want to point out, if you want to try organic rotational no-till where you roll the cover crop, plant your cash crop, then till a little bit to put your next cover crop in. Uh, this is really uh, the holy grail of uh, minimum till in uh, organic systems where you can actually do some no-till. One of the things that make it likely to succeed, previous experience with cover cropping and or uh, no-till, uh, you want a heavy uniform cover crop and you roll it down, it really does cover the ground like that. If you have a long, warm growing season, you have much more time to have a mature cover crop and a full season cash crop. You also have less issues of uh, soil being too cold for emergence and for nitrogen uh, mineralization. If your soil is already biologically active and healthy, uh, that's a big plus. A sandy, quick to warm up soil, of course, again, mitigates some of the risk factors. You definitely want light weed pressure with no perennial weeds. If you've got a lot of annual weeds or even a moderate amount of perennial weeds, they will pop up through this and defeat your no-till system. You'll be able to get out there with a heavy residue cultivator or hand weeding. It gets to be a, a real nuisance, a real cost. Um, 
one strategy, the easiest strategy to start with is to plant a strong nitrogen fixing cash crop such as soybean or lima bean or southern pea, cow pea, uh, black eyed beans into a rolled cereal grain. Because what happens is the cereal grain ties up nitrogen. Weeds are thwarted by that lack of nitrogen. Between that and the heavy residue, you've really got a big jump on the weeds. But meanwhile, you've got good nitrogen fixation, which is going to max out simply because you've tied up the nitrogen and the soybean is going to be fine. In fact, um, in the uh, central United States, where the yield sacrifice in organic no-till systems might be 30% in corn, soybean yields were equal or even slightly greater in the no-till system than um, organic with tillage. And that is uh, organic no-till, I meant. Okay, so here are another few other strategies for reducing tillage. Do strip or zone tillage. I mean, this could be ridge till or strip or just a narrow strip. What you're doing is you're disturbing the soil right where you're planting a crop, which means you're warming the soil, uh, you're releasing nutrients right where the crop needs it, but you're leaving all of this undisturbed. So there's fewer weeds popping up uh, from, you know, fewer annual weeds coming up from seed. You have, you're saving the organic matter and those long strips of undisturbed and residue covered is gonna reduce any erosive effects of wind or rain. Another approach is to simply till shallowly. This new uh, tool called the rotary harrow is very promising, uh, very good for making a, a seed bed for where the, where the residue isn't too heavy. If you've got heavier residue or a high biomass cover crop or sod that you wanna break the spading machine, um, if you're working on a fairly small scale where you don't mind something that's gonna work very slowly, you're driving through the field at barely one mile an hour. You don't wanna to try to do this on 50 acres, but if you've got three acres of market garden, very far superior to the moldboard plow for preparing a seed bed in one pass. You're disturbing the soil, but you're not inverting it. You're not pulverizing it. Another one that I really like is the sweep plow undercutter. This is very valuable in semi-arid regions because instead of turning under your residue or your cover crop, you're just undercutting all cover crops and weeds by skimming just below the surface. And that leaves the residue on the surface, at least most of the root mass undisturbed in the soil profile and uh, prepares you for minimum till planting. Um, another, another strategy I like is just take uh, this one grower, uh, Rick Felker at Mad Woman Creek Farm here in uh, Eastern Shore, Virginia. He took his rotary tiller and said, okay, I'm gonna turn this beast into something as kind to the soil. He turned down the PTO, so it turned slower and he turned up the tractor gear, so he spent less time over each square foot of soil. So instead of beating it to death, the tiller gently makes a seed bed, and even on the loamy sand soil, he can see crumb structure building up from his um, cover cropping and soil health program. And here's a resource I wanna mention, Reduced Tillage and Organic Systems Field Day Program Handbook. Lots of excellent information on various strip tillage approaches. Adjusting inputs, more is not, not always better, very often is not. So input frugality, um, this is an approach that I am gradually adopting in my own consulting with farmers who bring me their soil tests and say, what do I do that's organic? So firstly, you reduce the need for add, to add nutrients. You build healthy soil, grow deep rooted crops that'll retrieve nutrients. Uh, you won't be losing nutrients permanently from your system if you have those deep rooted crops retrieving them. Return all on-farm residues to the soil. Close your nutrient cycles. Integrating crops and livestock, as I mentioned, is a very powerful tool for diversified farms. And then I wanna emphasize, when you go ahead and try an input, be it a standard organic fertilizer like uh, feather meal or potassium sulfate or rock phosphate, or if it's one of these more uh, specialized new soil health products like Bokashi or biochar, do a side-by-side -side trial. Look at it, did the crop respond? Does your soil health look better? And did the unit yield increase or the uh, soil health improvement justify the costs? You may see real effects or you may see absolutely nothing. And the reason you see nothing, sometimes your soil is already healthy enough to meet the function that the uh, input would have provided. This is also really valuable for determining uh, fertilizer needs. Okay, here's, here's an example. Okay, I've been talking for a, a full hour now 
And I'll admit to you, I won't be able to tell you how to manage nitrogen on an organic farm, and here's why. It is so site-specific and so crop-specific um, that I would be a quack to try to tell you how to do it. Here's a few examples. Broccoli trials in Oregon, in Oregon and California found that yields increase up, the, the yields of broccoli increase steadily up to 220 pounds per acre of nitrogen. That's a huge amount. Now that's in feather meal or feather meal plus blood meal. And the return on the investment, four to $35, and this is at just $250, $250 a pound. This is not an exorbitant price. Per $1 feather meal, wow, we're really making money hand over fist. A little concern you that the, this much nitrogen, uh, these same trials verify there's serious nitrogen leaching and serious denitrification, enough nitrous oxide to negate all of the soil carbon sequestration from the winter cover crop. Pretty, um, a little bit, uh, quite a challenge there, a little bit disturbing. Here's another extreme, organic wheat in Utah. They tried a single application of a very nice, highly mature, uh, mature uh, manure compost that was a lot of bedding. So it was about a 20 to one C to N ratio. Nice, slow release, really good for soil life. Over a 15 year period, both the wheat yields and the soil organic matter doubled over the untreated. And you think, wow, that's gotta be a slam dunk. It didn't pay for itself. The wheat is a low yield crop. The baseline yields are extremely low because this is a very arid environment. And they have paid a moderately high price, something like $40, $50 a ton for this compost. And you need to multiply that by 22 tons and then it takes many years to pay for it. And here's a third example, organic lettuce in Colorado. And they put in row nitrogen. Now this is a little different. I'd have to admit that these broccoli trials, the nitrogen was broadcast, and I talked to one of the uh, principal investigators, and he said, yeah, if we did band it, it might have been more efficient. So just in summary, balanced approach to nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. You want to test your soil, test your compost, and do a crop foliar test. Very often, testing the crop foliage would tell you what the crop is seeing, and it may be very different from what you see in the soil. Like my own soil is fairly healthy. My own garden soil is fairly healthy. And I was doing a uh, nutrient management experiment one year with it. And the soil tested suboptimum in calcium, potassium, and boron, and phosphorus. Phosphorus tested low. I went and tested the, the crops, which were giving good yields or thriving. Uh, the crops, the foliage had right smack dab optimal levels of everything except the boron. So I only needed to add the boron in that case. So grow legumes to save money on nitrogen. Legume nitrogen generally costs about half as much as organic fertilizer nitrogen. And be sure to credit the legumes and your organic matter turnover and any amendments, manure, et cetera. Um, adding nitrogen in the band or by in-row drip uh, and using those other zone management techniques like strip tillage, ridge tillage, that'll concentrate your available nutrients um, in the crop row where you need it. Avoid over-irrigation if you're in an irrigated system because that'll leach away your nitrogen. Of course, if you live in the east and climate change is manifesting itself by torrential rains, which we've had lots of this year, that's hard to get away from, uh, but that's when you get your deep rooted cover crops in. And adjust compost rates generally based on soil phosphorus. If you're really low in soil phosphorus, yeah, go ahead and use it for your nitrogen and you'll build that up. But once the crop is showing enough phosphorus and your soil level is even getting up into the moderate range, ease way up and just put on as much as you're expecting to harvest off. And it turns out you don't necessarily have to even replenish all the potassium harvested off because most soil minerals, particularly here in the Southeast, but also on many other soil types, are very rich in, in potassium, have hundreds and tons of potassium per acre. Um, or tens of tons anyway. And the soil life and just natural weathering is gradually bringing that into circulation. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you for your patience. I did go a little bit over and uh, here we are. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark. Um, we have a few questions in the queue. So um, the first question is with no-till rolled cover crops, um, what about disease carryover? Uh, that is a good question. Um, 
the data on both mulching uh, with cover crops or applied mulch and with reduced tillage is that some diseases decrease in intensity and some increase. The more, uh, the more diverse your rotation, the less likely you are to build up a disease uh, under that mulch. Um, if you're planting a crop that's related to the cover crop or that shares a common disease, there are some nematodes and a few pathogenic fungi that are attack a wide range of uh, crops. I would say that rotation manual that I mentioned earlier gives some specifics on that. I don't really have all those committed to memory as, as to which would be better, which would be worse. Um, it, is a good, it is a good question and a good consideration, but overall, as your, as your cropping system diversity increase and your soil health improves, you should overall see a diminishing of the intensity of crop disease problems. Uh, if you have a wet, cool climate and you try the roll crimp cover crop um, and your soil is wetter than, than optimal, uh, yes, you can have risks of certain root rot diseases. Okay, thank you. Um, here's a comment about bare soil and stale seed beds will develop severe soil crusts that increase runoff, erosion, and water quality problems. Uh, that is a real concern. Stale seed bed is a powerful weed management tool in certain circumstances, but you, it is definitely a soil health sacrifice. You're, you're, it, it, there's a soil health cost. So the best I could recommend is do it only when necessary and then immediately follow it with a high biomass um, mixed species cover crop. Uh, and to resolve that surface crust, the two best things are fibrous rooted crops and something that's gonna cover the soil really well, like an organic mulch or a low growing, uh, full closed canopy uh, type cover crop. Okay, um, how do you feel about measuring microbial biomass as an indicator of soil health? Do you feel that you need to send soil off for such extensive testing upfront? Um, I wouldn't say that it's it's re, uh, required. Uh, I think we're in an early developmental stage for all of these soil health, soil biology measurements. Um, there are some interesting uh, uh, lab procedures for estimating uh, soil biomass. Um, to measuring it directly is a pretty complicated and involved procedure. Um, NRCS is actually working on a technical note, which hopefully they'll publish pretty soon on recommended soil health indicators and how to measure them, including microbial biomass and activity. Uh, a fairly simple indicator of microbial activity is the Solvita respiration test. Um, it's sometimes done as just a single day test, but uh, others have done it as, as a four day incubation. Uh, seems to give the most uh, reliable results. Um, I'm hopeful that within another five or 10 years that we may get to the point where these kind of soil biology, soil health tests are as available and not much more expensive than a standard soil test. Uh, I may be a little optimistic there, um, but we're definitely making progress in that direction. I would say um, Probably the best way to monitor soil health is uh, to do the regular soil test. Be sure you include the organic matter. Uh, use a penetrometer or just a simple field flag to measure whether there are compaction layers. And just observe as your soil getting gradually darker and looser and more crumbly. Are crops responding better and better? Um, do you see a fair number of earthworms and uh, earthworm casts? Okay, do you have any idea on what and when to plant as a winter grazing crop for cattle in the Pacific Northwest? Um, I'm out of my depth in two ways in that, uh, but the first thing that came to my mind was winter cereal grains because you got a cool, moist climate, but not terribly cold. Um, if you get it planted early enough in the fall, so you got a decent stand, then you could probably graze in the winter. Uh, one thing that's going to happen with very heavy rainfall in the winter is a great risk of compaction by the grazing animals. Um, as I said, I, I've, I've never strung a, a, a fence line for uh, rotational grazing and never milked a cow, uh, never chased a beaver back in, you know, beef cow back into the um, 
field or anything like that. So I have no experience there. Okay. So here's a question. So cost pays a major cost plays a major role in soil health. Well, uh, the cost, the reason I mentioned the cost is that every time you undertake a new management practice, it requires new materials or equipment or even more labor, there is a cost there. But then you want to balance that against the benefits or the avoided costs. Uh, one of the things that happens when your soil is healthy, you don't need as much irrigation water, you don't need as much fertilization. Uh, weed management is easier. You don't need as many cultivations, perhaps. Uh, so... Uh, when we're looking at it through the lens of risk management, then we are interested in costs and benefits. So you, every time you change your practices, you're going to save on some things and, and uh, spend more on others. For instance, if you're a, a conventional grower uh, doing GMO strains of corn and soy, and then you go organic and give them up, you're going to save on seed costs probably because uh, you won't be facing the technology fees. On the other hand, you're going to spend a little bit more for cultivation and for organic fertilizer. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but um, soil health management sometimes entails costs, and sometimes, uh, but very often, as your soil health improves, uh, you're going to be spending less to bring your crop to uh, uh, to harvest. Okay, so um, here's a comment about um, compaction. Um, it usually happens only when leaving animals on the cover crop for too long. Um, one needs to use adaptive grazing techniques to prevent compaction and pugging. Yeah, point very well taken. Take half, leave half. I saw that comment there too. Um, I have a very general familiar, familiarity with the general area of management intensive grazing. There's all these different systems, mob grazing, adaptive multi paddock management, holistic management, regenerative grazing. Um, there are a lot of variations with climate and location and soil type and what you have growing. Uh, I would just say get local, talk to local farmers or local extension who are, you know, well versed in the best management intensive grazing practice for that region. Okay, yeah, feel free, anyone who has questions, to type them in. It's a great opportunity, and we still have a few minutes where we can answer them. Um, meanwhile, I just want to mention the um, Organic Farming Research Foundation Risk Management Guides, which you can find at the link on your screen by simply going to their website. And I also put a direct which is link, which is much longer, but if you just go to their website, you'll be able to find those. One is about crop insurance, and the other one is about the topic addressed in this webinar. Um, also, um, I put a link in the chat box to where you can find the slide handout and the presentation notes um, for this particular webinar. Mark always puts even more information into his presentation notes. And that's right now where you registered for the webinar on the webinar registration page, but that will also turn into the page where the webinar will be archived as well as on the eOrganic YouTube channel. So I don't see any more questions in the queue. I think I'll just wait another few seconds here just to see if any turn up. Okay, um, if you could speak more about oh. using plant tissue samples to compare or back up soil samples. Ah, uh, well, I'm not sure what I would add. What you do is, um, you want to talk to the lab that will do the sample. You want a full nutrient analysis that covers all the major and minor uh, uh, micronutrients that the plant needs and follow directions closely so that you gather the leaves from the right part of the plant at the right developmental stage so that they can interpret it accurately. And there are research-based ranges for what is considered deficient, adequate, and excessive in the, in the uh, crop. And you also want to look at it in light of how well your crop is doing. Like if you have a crop that looks healthy and it's yielding well and you get the results back and let's say everything is right in the um, ideal range, except maybe you're just a little bit short of boron, you might say, okay, well, we probably should put some boron on in order to sustain yields. Um, but if your crop is not thriving, uh, and it's showing certain symptoms, then you want to look at the nutrient uh, report through the lens of, okay, what may be causing this? And there may be one nutrient that's just a little bit low, 
or a little bit high, and that imbalance could be constraining development, or it could be factors not related directly to nutrient content. Um, I think that I think though that I mean, for instance, I gave the example earlier of, of um, and in fact, that same garden where I said that uh, the soil tested low in several nutrients, but the plants were only short of boron. Uh, a few years later, I went out there and, my, and I put the tomatoes out and they took off beautifully. They were growing like crazy. And all of a sudden, one day it looked like they had been hit either by herbicide drift or a tomato spotted wilt virus. And I thought, oh my God, I better check out the virus. So I grabbed the worst plant, ran to Virginia Tech and said, can you tell me, is this tomato spotted wilt virus or is it somebody coming in smoking tobacco and it's tobacco mosaic? They wrote back to me two years, days later, didn't see any viruses, checked for boron deficiency. So I went back to my nutrient management study and I go, that's right. Boron's the only thing that was low in soil and plant. So I went out there and sprayed a little borax and I didn't totally rescue the crop, but it did recover enough to give us, you know, enough tomatoes for our homestead needs. So, and then the next year I put pound of boron per acre. And then I said, oh my, this is the first time I've been able to grow beets here to save my life. Well, they're a heavy boron feeder. They get you bor short of boron, you get little tiny woody beets and that's what I've been getting. <laughs> so, you know, those are kind of things. That was, that was a tip off from the, from the plant. And everything else, the soil showed a little short, but uh, there was plenty of soil life to, for the plants to access what they needed. Okay, well, thank you for all those questions. Um, as I mentioned, you'll be able to find the recording of this webinar in about a week on the e organic YouTube channel. And we'd be very grateful if you could fill out the follow-up email survey, which you'll be receiving later today. Our next webinar is coming up on February 19th with Kerry Rivard of Kansas State University, who's gonna be talking about crop diversification in high tunnels. So you are all very welcome to attend that. So thank you again, Mark, as mm -hmm. always. And we hope you can all join us for many other webinars this season. And you can just find those by typing in webinars by eOrganic. So thanks everyone for coming. Okay, thank you.